the multipolar old media landscape has had significant ramifications for the relationship between media and war. But what are these ramifications and how do they impact upon the broader political dimensions of conflict? Old media platforms are materially vast and expensive infrastructures. They function according to Fordist or industrialist modes of production, just like assembly lines. And so building, operating and maintaining traditional media platforms was exceedingly expensive and therefore could only be afforded by those with sufficient financial sources and political power. And that is empires, states and more recently global media corporations. Throughout history, therefore, states and empires have not only been the primary sponsors, but also in most cases the direct owners of conventional media platforms. And this close and very intimate relationship between the state and state-owned traditional media has meant that in times of war, the latter has regularly functioned as a highly censored propaganda tool for the former. The most obvious examples of this power relationship can be found in authoritarian regimes. Think of the media in Nazi Germany, in Iran or in North Korea. Or think of the political influence recently exerted on the media by authorities in Russia, in Turkey or in China. But even in liberal democratic societies, where the media has often been owned by private citizens or news corporations, and where it has been celebrated as the fourth estate and the guarantor of freedom of speech independent from government control, the state, in times of war, has maintained a large amount of control over the media. Furthermore, traditionally the actual production of news required a large pool of highly trained specialists such as editors, journalists, technicians, typesetters, cameramen, and sound engineers. This creates a fundamental separation between sender and receiver, a separation which endows a small minority with productive agency, whilst reducing the vast majority of citizens to passive media consumers. This means that old media platforms create a news environment of mass monologue, where news production and communication is flowing in only one direction. Limited agency has meant that the number of central media gatekeepers that governments have to control in order to exert political influence over how their wars are being mediatized is relatively small. In fact, this traditionally small number has shrunk dramatically over the last few decades as a result of oligopolization. Oligopolization describes a process whereby, from mergers and hostile takeovers, progressively fewer actors or corporations control increasingly larger shares of the global media market. This concentration of traditional media ownership started in the 1980s and has since seen the rise of ever larger profit-oriented media conglomerates with a global reach. For instance, the number of independent television stations in the United States alone has reduced from over a hundred in the early 1980s to just five by 2014. In Latin America, 85% of the media market today is owned by merely seven news corporations. In Australia, Ownership of 90% of all media outlets is now shared by News Corporation, Time Warner and Fairfax. In Germany, the four largest print publishers own about 60% of a market that comprises 900 newspapers and magazines and over 1,200 specialized periodicals. And in the United Kingdom, about 80% of the press is controlled by only four corporations. And the situation there is similar for broadcast media. Many of these media oligopolies are global in reach. 
and they have invested their assets across various media platforms from television, radio, newspapers, publishing houses, music production, all the way to cinema and internet. For example, the Walt Disney Company is the world's largest media conglomerate, with assets encompassing movies, television, publishing and theme parks. Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, the world's second largest news conglomerate, owns 800 media companies in 50 different countries. This concentration of global media ownership has had direct implications for both the quality and diversity of news reporting. Driven primarily by profit interests and concern for market shares, rather than by the desire to uphold high journalistic standards and to critically scrutinize government policies, most media oligopolies have started replacing serious news with infotainment. This process, which has been the flip side of oligopolization, is most visible in the decline of investment in investigative journalism within old media platforms. More than any other area of journalism, investigative journalism has traditionally symbolized the media's self-proclaimed role as the fourth estate, which scrutinizes, questions and checks government policies. But because it requires larger, more long-term investment with oftentimes uncertain outcome, investigative journalism has become the biggest victim in today's corporatized global media market. No doubt, the process of oligopolization has turned media conglomerates into very powerful global actors. And yet, at the same time, it has also been good news for Western governments. Governments who are concerned with how their wars are being represented and visualized. Oligopolization has meant that the number of crucial gatekeepers that need to be controlled has dropped dramatically. And this has thereby facilitated the ability of states to control the nature of war reporting. Add to this that most governments, including liberal democratic ones, tend to attach a strategic importance to the mediatization of their wars. As a result, states have shown an inherent interest in managing and in controlling the media in times of war. In liberal democracies, for instance, media management has been central not only to creating but also to sustaining the popular notions of costless wars an imagination underwritten by the repeated replay of bombs-eye views transmitted from precision-guided missiles as they descend to their predetermined targets. Carefully selected images of Western military operations suggest a grammar of killing that avoids the spilling of blood. They represent Western warfare as precise, discriminate and clean. This ability to frame the perception of Western operations as humane and surgical has been essential to creating and sustaining the legitimacy of warfare in the eyes of democratic publics. What does all of this mean? The material and structural nature of this traditional media landscape has had significant ramifications for the relationship between old media and war. States have enjoyed a near monopoly over the traditional mass media platforms, in particular in times of war.